Hello and welcome back to the Fall of the Roman Empire. It's Nick Holmes and this is episode 60 called Cutting Off Your Right Hand. In 453, the Romans celebrated Attila's death, but it didn't bring peace and stability. Indeed, It was just the opposite. The replacement of a Hunnic empire in Central Europe with at least nine different tribal groupings created a crisis of political instability, which ultimately caused the extinction of the Western Roman Empire. First, it contributed to one of the most extraordinary events in all of Roman history. On the 21st of September 454, Aetius was stabbed to death by Valentinian III. Yes, You heard that right. Aetius, the man who defeated Attila, was murdered by the feeble-minded Western Emperor. Attila's death was certainly one of the reasons behind this bizarre event. Aetius had always had a special relationship with the Huns. It began back in 423 when he brought a Hunnic army to Italy in support of the usurper John. He was too late to save John, but he used the Huns to force Galla Placidia to make him governor of Gaul. In Gaul, he used Hunnic mercenaries to develop his own fiefdom, separate from Italy. When Attila launched his attack on Gaul, of course, his ally became his enemy. But he turned a threat into an opportunity by rallying the Germans to his standard. And he got lucky. He risked everything on one battle. And had he lost the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, he would have lost everything. But when he won, he became Rome's greatest hero. No one could touch him. But everything changed when Attila died and the Huns became just another barbarian tribe. Suddenly, Aetius's special position was gone. He could neither ally with the Huns nor lead the fight against them. Now this was when the relationship between Aetius and Valentinian suddenly changed. Valentinian had always lived in Aetius's shadow. He'd only been six years old when he came to the throne in 425, and by 454 he was 35. During this time, they'd been useful to each other. Aetius was the de facto ruler of the Western Empire in exchange for protecting Valentinian. But with the Huns gone, did Valentinian need protecting? And this created the first real tension between the two of them. Who was really the boss? For the first time, Aetius and Valentinian fell out over two separate incidents. The first happened when the Eastern Emperor Theodosius II died in 450. Valentinian, in a rare moment of self-possession, had wanted to go to Constantinople to claim the Eastern throne, but Aetius told him not to. Aetius's opposition was sensible. Valentinian had no friends in Constantinople. Although Pulcheria, Theodosius' sister, was his cousin, she had her own designs on the imperial throne and had no time for her dim-witted relation in the West. As for the Eastern army, who were the genuine power, they had no respect for Valentinian, who, everyone knew, was only Aetius's puppet. But Valentinian was offended by Aetius's clear disregard for him, and this grew into a festering resentment when Attila died, and Valentinian could dream about being his own master. Second, Valentinian started to feel threatened by Aetius, and there was some justification for this, because Aetius was planning to exploit the opportunity provided by the fact that Valentinian had no son. The emperor was married to Theodosius II's daughter, Licinia Eudocia, and the couple had two daughters, Eudocia and Placidia, born in the late 430s. But thereafter, no further children were born, and for whatever reason, whether infertility or something else, by the 450s, it was pretty clear there wouldn't be a son and heir to the throne. But Aetius had a son. This was Gaudentius, born to his wife Pelagia, a Gothic princess, who, despite being previously married to Aetius's rival Bonifacius, was, according to Gregory of Tours, devoted to Aetius. 
Now, Aetius had persuaded Valentinian to betroth Gaudentius to his youngest daughter, Placidia. It's worth mentioning that Valentinian's eldest daughter, Eudocia, was already pledged to Geiseric's son, Huneric, as part of the peace deal with the Vandals in the early 440s. And this meant that, in Roman eyes at least, she would not be an empress. However, we'll be hearing a lot more about this, since that was not the Vandal view of the situation. But in 454, it was Placidia who held the key to unlocking a new dynasty uniting Valentinians and Aetius's families. And that moment was fast approaching, because Placidia was now nearly 15 years old, and the marriage was imminent. Enter two new characters in our story, Petronius Maximus and Heraclius. Who are they, you might rightly ask, and why do they matter? Petronius Maximus was a high-ranking Roman senator, and Heraclius was the eunuch head of the emperor's household. And they both wanted to get rid of Aetius, for reasons we'll come back to, and urged Valentinian to act fast to save his own life before it was too late. They started whispering in Valentinian's ear that Aetius was plotting against him, They said that once the marriage happened, Gaudentius would be the heir to the throne and it wouldn't be long before Aetius sent someone to do away with him and make his son emperor. And there might have been some truth in that. Aetius had an insidious track record of backstabbing and murdering his way to the top. For example, not only had he backed the usurper John against Galla Placidia, but thereafter he'd connived to murder his fellow general and rival Felix back in 428, followed by Bonifacius in 432. Hearing this from his trusted advisers, Valentinian suddenly broke into a cold sweat. So, Maximus and Heraclius urged him, let's do something about it. And they did. On the 21st of September, 454, Priscus has left us with an account of what happened. Quote, As Aetius was explaining the finances and calculating the tax revenues, with a shout, Valentinian suddenly leapt up from his throne and cried out that he would no longer bear being the victim of so many drunken depravities. By holding him responsible for the troubles, he said Aetius wanted to deprive him of power in the West, just as he deprived him of the Eastern Empire. Empire, insinuating that it was Aetius's fault he didn't go and expel Marcion from office. As Aetius was marvelling at this unexpected outburst and was trying to divert him from his irrational charge, Valentinian drew his sword from his sheath and rushed at him, with Heraclius, who was also carrying a knife under his cloak. Both men repeatedly struck Aetius's head and killed this man who had accomplished many manly deeds." End quote. According to Edward Gibbon, it was probably the first and only time that the emperor used a sword. A chronicler, John of Antioch, wrote that when Valentinian proudly boasted to the Roman Senate of his actions, saying, Did I not perform the killing of Aetius well? A senator replied with a remark which has gone down in history, quote, Whether well or not, I do not know. But know that you cut off your right hand with your left, end quote. Even if no one really said these words, there can be little doubt that it was what everyone thought. Valentinian was certainly triumphant in his treachery. He rounded up Aetius' supporters and put them to death. The most prominent was the Praetorian prefect of Italy, a senator by the name of Boethius, grandfather of the famous philosopher. But Valentinian found that ruling in his own right was very different from being a puppet protected by Aetius. He was as naive as he was incompetent. And nearly six months after killing Aetius, on the 16th of March, 455, he was himself killed. And the man and behind it was the same Petronius Maximus who arranged for two guards officers, Optilla and Thraustilla, who had been Aetius's retainers, or Bucellari, as the members of the personal armies of late Roman generals were called, to kill him. This happened in Rome, where Valentinian had moved, after he got rid of Aetius, to try to win popularity with the Roman Senate and the troops based in the city, none of whom were impressed with his shocking murder of Aetius. Valentinian certainly made a monumental mistake when he allowed Optilla and Thraustilla to join his own imperial guard. Indeed, Thraustilla is claimed by one source to have been Aetius' son-in-law, having married an unnamed daughter of his. 
Both men were only too eager to take revenge on their master's murderer. How Valentinian was oblivious of this is hard to see. Equally foolishly, he'd taken to attending the military training sessions at the Campus Marcius in the city in a vain attempt to prove that he was not the idle fool most people thought him. It was there that Priscus tells us Optila and Thraustilla were waiting for the emperor and his eunuch Heraclius. Priscus tells us the gory story. Quote, when Valentinian dismounted from his horse and was walking off to practice archery, Optilla and his followers attacked him. Drawing the swords hanging at their sides, they advanced. Optilla struck Valentinian on the side of the head, and as he turned to see who'd assaulted him, Optilla struck a second blow against his eye that killed him. Thraustilla then killed Heraclius. End quote. So died the last of the Theodosian emperors. No soldiers at the Campus Marcius lifted a finger to stop the killing, and not a tear was shed for him. But what was really going on, and why did Maximus kill Valentinian? Now, I mentioned earlier that I'd come back to Maximus's motives, and this gets a bit complicated because our sources give us two different versions. One left to us by the chronicler John of Antioch is that he had no gripe with Aetius, but he did with Valentinian. This was because the emperor had raped his wife. The story was that Maximus and Valentinian liked to play dice for money. Maximus lost and was in debt to the emperor, who'd always lusted after his beautiful wife, Lucina. Valentinian demanded Maximus's ring as security for the debt, and then sent the ring to Lucina, summoning her to the palace. Lucina thought it was Maximus who needed her help and rushed to the palace, only to be confronted by Valentinian, who forced her to have dinner with him and then raped her. She went home furious with her husband since she thought he'd offered her in settlement for his debt. That was the end of their marriage, and Maximus swore he would kill Valentinian. But he knew he couldn't get close to the emperor so long as Aetius was alive to protect him. So he thought up a plan to kill Aetius first and Valentinian second. While this story has all the hallmarks of a great Hollywood movie and delighted Edward Gibbon, who retold it as the version he believed in, our far more reliable 5th century chronicler Priscus doesn't mention this romantic entanglement at all and merely says that Maximus was an ambitious man who wanted to become the new Aetius by dominating the weak-willed Valentinian. He says that it was the eunuch Heraclius who viewed him as a rival and blocked him. Quote, Maximus visited Valentinian after Aetius's murder to be promoted to consul. Failing in this, he wanted to become a patrician, but Heraclius didn't grant him this rank either. Heraclius was pursuing the same course as Maximus and didn't want to have any power counterbalanced to his own. So he beat back Maximus's efforts by convincing Valentinian, who was now free from Aetius's influence, that he didn't need to transfer Aetius's power to others. End quote. I think Priscus's account is probably more reliable, but there could well be some truth in John of Antioch's more scandalous version. For the next day, on the 17th of March, 455, when Maximus was proclaimed emperor by the Roman soldiers in the city, probably helped by a donative of gold he paid them, the first thing he did was to pay a visit to Valentinian's new widow, Eudocia, and forced her against her will to marry him. His next step was to dispatch the highly regarded senator Avitus, the man who had persuaded the Visigoths to join Aetius against Attila back in 451, to persuade them to back Maximus. The Roman poet and chronicler Sidonius has left us with a lengthy description of Avitus's embassy to the Visigoths, and although he does his best to dress it up as a mission to force submission from the Visigoths, in fact, it was the exact opposite. It was an appeal for military aid from the most powerful barbarian group in continental Europe. This went completely against Aetius's strategy, which had always been to oppose the Visigoths, since he regarded them as the biggest threat to what remained of Roman Gaul. Maximus 
sought an alliance with the Visigoths from a position of weakness, whereas in the past, Aetius had been able to use his alliance with the Huns as a way of keeping them in check. Even after the Huns had been defeated at the Battle of the Catalonian Plains, Aetius persuaded the Visigoths to return home rather than pursue the Huns so that he could prevent their destruction and keep them as a counterweight to the Visigoths. This is very revealing because it shows what a hollow shell the Western Empire had become. Maximus desperately needed the support of one of the major barbarian groups because the Western Roman army had long ceased to be anything other than a collection of second-rate garrison troops. This is where the historian Peter Heather argues that the breakup of Attila's empire was actually a bad thing for the Western Romans because when the Huns had been all-powerful, Aetius could use them to balance the power of the barbarians. But now the Huns were gone, the Romans were fully exposed as the impotent power that they were and it was only a matter of time before one of the Germanic kingdoms sacked Rome again. And that now happened very quickly, because Maximus made a terrible mistake. He forgot about the Vandals. Geiseric the Vandal King had a particular gripe against Maximus, for not only had Maximus married Valentinian's widow Licinia Eudocia, but he'd also married his son, Palladius, to her eldest daughter, also called Eudocia. This was a foolish mistake, for, as I mentioned earlier, Eudocia had long been betrothed to Geisrich's son, Huneric. Two of our main sources say that it was the Empress herself who, in her fury against Maximus, secretly appealed to the Vandal King, in a way very reminiscent of how the Princess Honoria had appealed to Attila. Priscus wrote, quote, Eudocia, the wife of Valentinian, out of distress at the murder of her husband and her forced marriage, secretly summoned Geiseric, who crossed from Africa to Rome with a large fleet. End quote. It was a dangerous thing to do, especially given what Attila had done when he invaded Italy in 452. But her resentment against her husband's murderer is understandable, and she may have thought she could quickly terminate Maximus's usurpation, since there were already signs he was floundering in his new role. First, the eastern emperor Marcion would not recognise him. Second, the chronicler Sidonius says that the Senate and the Roman mob started to turn against him, sensing that he wasn't up to the job. Quote, This man, once made emperor and prisoned in the palace walls, was ruining his own success before the first evening fell. End quote. Maximus's problems were exacerbated by the lightning speed with which Geiseric acted. No sooner had he seized the throne in March 455 than the Vandal king began to gather an army and set sail. He was probably motivated not just by his wish to lay claim to Eudocia for his son, but also by his knowledge that the Western Empire was in a state of disarray. What little remained of the Western army was not concentrated in Rome and instead seems to have been dispersed around Italy and southern Gaul, garrisoning the major towns, meaning that Rome was an easy target. Geiseric may also have been worried by Avitus's embassy to the Goths. As mentioned before, the Vandals and Goths were sworn enemies ever since Huneric had disfigured Theodoric's daughter, who had been his first wife. Geiseric may have been worried that a Roman Gothic alliance was in the offing, and he wanted to strike first. Too late, Maximus realised his mistake. The Vandals were now on their way, and there was no Roman army to fight them. They docked at Ostia, Rome's port, in June 455, just a couple of months after Maximus seized the throne. There was panic in the city and the man who panicked the most was Maximus. According to Priscus, quote, Maximus mounted his horse and fled. The imperial bodyguards and the freemen he used to trust the most deserted him. When they saw him riding away, they mocked him and berated his cowardice. 
Just as he was about to leave the city, someone threw a stone at the side of his head and killed him. Arriving at the scene, a mob tore his corpse to pieces and, carrying his limbs on a pole, they sang songs of victory. And so he met the end of life in this way. End quote. First Aetius, then Valentinian, and now Maximus were dead, and the Vandals were at the gates of Rome. And that ends this episode. Thanks so much for listening and I hope you enjoyed it. And if you did, of course, I'd be delighted for any ratings or reviews in whichever podcast app you use. And if you want to hear more about the Romans and also to receive a free ebook, please visit my website at nickholmesauthor.com. There's a link to it in the text description of this podcast in whichever app you're listening to right now. And since I'm in the final stages of publishing my next book called The Fall of Rome, the next episode will be in two weeks' time on the 13th of May when we'll hear about the Vandal Sack of Rome. Thanks for listening and see you next time. 